Okay, hello, and welcome to yet another wonderful school year. I hope all of you are enjoying yourselves, and I hope you're excited to be back, and you're excited to embark upon your last year here at Fairfield College Preparatory School. So what we're doing here is essentially we're looking at some of the major topics that we will be looking at throughout the course of the year. And we're doing it in such a way that you can go back and take a look at them at your leisure, um, viewing some of the main themes and maybe some of the vocabulary, things like that, to better facilitate the learning process. So, it's our first major topic is essentially how we arrive at what the graduated graduation is, which will become a major theme throughout the course of your social ethics class. <clears throat> and how these types of things find their basis in Ignatius, as well as in your boy and mine, the Jesus of Christ. Uh, so first, let's take a look at the major tenets of the graduate of graduation. And we're going to be talking about these things a little bit more in depth in class, but just to kind of illustrate some of the things that are very important to me, I basically see that all of our religious life, our, our life, if you will, is made up of three major components. Uh, and I think that these are the three major ways that we find the spirit, if you will. Uh, Lady Wisdom, you know, the Holy Spirit, the mystical, uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, something other than. Um, and essentially, I'm not really overly concerned with what your creed or your code is. Uh, I'm more concerned about finding truth. And I think that we find ourselves truth in three major ways, at least through three major avenues. Um, and those are either by being religious or spiritual, by connecting directly with the spirit, through academics, it's intellectually competent, meaning that we learn about these things, we take time to uh, review, whether it be scripture or philosophy or psychology or sociology or really, I mean, whatever the academic subject is, I mean, you can find God by doing algebra if, uh, if your mind's open enough up to it, um, or at least, you know, what, what I believe God to be. And also through service work. Now, as you know, you'll be doing two hours a week to a dedicated service uh, assignment. Uh, it is my belief that if you are open to this calling, that, that you will at some point connect yourself to the spirit with it. So if you are working in an after school program, it will eventually become that you are, um, you know, connecting with the children and finding yourself kind of in awe of, of what they're doing. Same thing with the elderly, same thing with those who are mentally challenged, uh, same thing with the homeless. I mean, when you go in with the mindset of serving others, so often it is that we find that we serve ourselves. Um, and that kind of amazement, that, that surprise that we feel as we are, are transitioning into um, kind of a different relationship, meaning a, a different perspective of what service is. You know, I go to serve, and yet I am the one who is being serviced. Um, when, we, when we discover that, that's, that's a moment of mystery. That's a moment of grace. Uh, that's a moment where we, where we kind of touch the divine. And um, we can do that in a lot of different ways. I mean, as I said, like you can do that in the pews. You can do that when you receive communion. You can do that in silent meditation. Um, you can do that in community when you sit in youth group, when you sit in, in scriptural study, when you sit in book group, uh, when you sit in your clubs, when you sit in your teams. All of those things are types of, of religious um, exploration, you know. Uh, when our teams um, pump each other up before a game and they, they kneel and they say the Hail Mary and they come together and they, they all, you know, the captain scream, Our Lady, Queen of Victory, and everybody rallies around and says, pray for us. In this moment, we're all kind of excited and up. Um, that moment is, it's really a moment of grace. It's really a moment where you're connecting with something bigger than yourself. Um, and really, I mean, uh, what, what else is there to call God than something bigger than yourself, something that is doesn't quite make perfect sense? 
Um, this, I don't know if this has happened to you during your academic studies yet, but this will happen to you um, during your academic studies that you just kind of, something hits you, something that just isn't right. You don't get it, and you're just, you're, you, you can't get enough of it. I mean, I remember when I was a senior in high school at prep, and the first time I ever read Plato, I read the Eupithero, and I was just like, this guy is the man. He's such a sarcastic, snarky jerk. And, you know, he's, he's considered one of the greatest philosophers of all time. Like, what is this all about? And I, I remember very distinctly just having this feeling that I'd never had before in terms of my academic life of, of wanting to know more, of, of being driven uh, to reading more and, and to learning more. Um, and I know that all of you have experienced that with something. And, and we've kind of covered the committed to doing justice part, but all of these are avenues towards God, um, and they, they depend upon one another, much like the, the Trinity depends upon itself, you know, and depends upon each individual part to function as the whole. These parts function within themselves. So as long as you're open to the moving of the spirits, which I think is a, a beginning point, I believe that you'll find yourself focusing on one of these three major areas, committed to doing justice, intellectually competent, and religious, which will eventually make you into a loving, mature adult, you know? I mean, or what we would call an adult, I suppose. Um, a loving, you know, servant. Um, so, I mean, that's that's basically our you know, three minute introduction to the graduate of graduation. Maybe I went a little bit over three minutes, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a look and, and continue on and find out where these things are going. So as we move ahead, we see that, you know, Ignatius's life is, is the kind of blueprint for what the grad of grad will become. And, and as you know, I mean, we're, we, we live in a Jesuit school Ignatius is very, very important. So you are familiar with these themes. You know about the cannonball. Um, you know about how this, uh, this caused Ignatius' conversion. You know that, that he um, was the soldier who was, you know, very Braveheart-esque. Um, and hopefully if I am, am feeling up to it, I'll have a little bit more of an animated telling of this story um, for you all at the beginning of August. Um, in those hot days when we're all really just don't want to be there. But um, you know about the conversion. You know about him reading the life of Christ and the life of the saints. Um, so let's spend some time focusing on some things that we don't typically focus on in Ignatius. Um, <clears throat> Ignatius spent so much time in his life after the conversion uh, on the River Cardona and, and in Manresa, in the caves. Uh, there, after he had given up his sword in Montserrat, he, he was plagued by his previous life. He could not forgive himself. And really, that's what it was. It was, it was forgiving himself for his, his past deeds, you know, his, his um, sexing and his his scrapping and his fighting. Um, and really, I think one of the unexplored themes is that Ignatius was a soldier and Ignatius uh, fought often. Ignatius was eventually, at one point, accused of murder. I, I think it's possible that Ignatius could have, and this is just my opinion, please do not take this to the bank, but I think it's possible that Ignatius could have killed somebody. And I think that that weighed so heavily upon him because that sin you know, the taking of another human life, regardless of whether it's in a war or it's in, you know, cold blood or it's in self-defense, uh, the, there's a stain upon you that I, I'm not sure it, it, it's, I'm not sure that he felt he could forgive himself. And he went to, he went to confession every day and the priest, he confessed the same sins day after day. And the priest was like, you know, shut up, geez, just, just get over it. And he couldn't, and he was he was talking at the time to this golden serpent who, um, you know, many scholars believe was was possibly a representation of Satan. Um, 
who was tempting him. He was considering suicide and all these different things. I mean, it, it, what we what we get from all this, what am I getting at, is that there are some very serious militaristic themes in Ignatius's life. And for him, it's either all good or all bad. There's very little gray in between. So it's not surprising that we find that his spirituality is set on a theme of duality um, or that there is good and that there is evil in the world and that these two things are constantly battling. I mean, if you take a look at the two standards, which is a meditation that we will, we will do together, um, it is literally about two armies fighting one another, an army of good and an army of evil, and it asks you to place yourself on one of the sides. I mean, this is what Ignatius's worldview was. You're either working for good or you're working for evil. Um, I think many of us would, would believe that, and that this is not necessarily how the world works, but it does challenge us to say, okay, well, if the, there are only two things, then where am I? And what am I working for? You know, am I working for the world? Am I working for uh, the destruction of others? Am I working in a place that hurts others? Am I working um, towards the betterment of humanity? Or am I working for solely the betterment of myself? Um, and this is what, you know, Ignatius expresses again, a very similar theme and his theme of consolation. He's talking about, you know, the idea that he's being consoled or um, he's being moved along by God. So those are the highs, those spiritual highs, whereas desolation, he feels like, you know, it's a desolate plane, like there's nobody there. And he feels like he's been left by God in times of desolation. And in the spiritual life, Ignatius felt like that we will all go through times of consolation and desolation, regardless of whether or not we are doing good things or bad things, you know, I mean, and, and that is where things get a little bit tricky. So how do we determine what to do with those moments of times of consolation and desolation? Well, obviously, we find ourselves in study and prayer of the spiritual exercises. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at that. Okay, so here we are, and we are entering into the principle and the foundation where we learn that Ignatius tells us that human beings are created to reverence and praise God. And to that end, we are to use all of God's created goodness um, in order to, to do that praising and reverencing. So, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people have taken this to mean that, well, God has given us the earth, and therefore we can go ahead and destroy it in whatever way we desire. But if we take a step back and take a look at this and kind of remove ourselves as the center of the universe, we can say that doing what is good for the Earth, for, you know, Mother Earth, is good and pleasing to God because it will help to extend our time here. Um, so when we use creation to praise and reverence God, let's take an example of uh, farming rights. Um, just very briefly, uh, what, in, in my opinion, in my estimation, something that is good for the earth um, is, is to recycle. And not necessarily just to recycle our plastics and things like that, but a great example of this is the, uh, the film No Impact Man, uh, which I have on reserve if you desire to, to take a gander at it. Um, and so if we lessen our impact on the environment and on the earth, then um, th this is necessarily a good thing. So for instance, we take all of our food waste, um, all of our vegetables, everything that can be broken down, um, and we make a compost pile out of it. And that way we can grow good, huge, delicious um, you know, fruit and vegetables, and we can do it basically all naturally. Um, that's a good thing. You know, I know it sounds very hippie crunchy. Um, and if you are, you know, against that, then I'm sorry. But um, it, it, it really is. It's something that 
is very easy to do. It doesn't hurt anybody, and it only helps ourselves and others. Um, now, something that I would say is maybe not so great for the Earth, and is kind of against the natural order of things, is if uh, we take a look at a company like Monsanto, which has been spending years and millions upon millions of dollars developing seed that does not reproduce. So once you plant, say you're a farmer in Iowa and you're um, you know, planting corn because good Lord knows that I'll be making the United States of America the corn now, um, you're gonna go ahead and have to buy that seed from Monsanto. And what you're gonna have to go ahead and do with it is after that corn it bears fruit um, and after the harvest, the corn will not give you any seed to plant next season. So therefore, this bioengineered seed, you have to keep on buying season after season new seed from the company. Now this is great from a business standpoint, um, but it completely defies all of the laws of nature, um, which is, is pretty, pretty wild if you ask me. Um, so these are just a few very brief examples of the way that consolation and desolation finds itself in our lives uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and the ways that we can kind of use creation as good um, and creation for evil purposes. So, and, and my proposal to you, and you can take this as you will, is that anytime we use creation to better community, and the commons, um, we are doing something that is pleasing to God. Because in, in God's view, in God's eye, scripturally, religiously, uh, throughout any religious tradition, we're going to find that God likes people. He doesn't necessarily, God doesn't care, she doesn't care if you are uh, Canadian or, you know, from Uzbekistan or if you are Arnold Schwarzenegger or if you are an Aborigine. Um, these are things that are meaningless. People are just people are just people. Um, and we've seen this kind of perspective from our sages, if you will, um, a person like Gandhi or Oscar Romero or Dorothy Day or Martin Luther King or Dean Brackley or you know all these different folks who who have come to understand that all of humanity is intimately connected. Um, so you know this is a theme that we're going to get into much deeper throughout the course of the year. For now, let's go ahead and take a look at Genesis chapters one through four, and I would recommend taking a, a reading of these chapters. They are the two creation stories. Um, I know that, that you are familiar with them and that you've heard them since your birth, but there's so much there that, that we may overlook. And I'm just going to give you two quick examples of some of those things that we overlook right now. So Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse one verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth had no form and was void. Darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. There was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Now let's, let's jump right on ahead to verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14, the fourth day. God said, let there be lights in the ceiling of the sky to separate the night and to serve as signs for the seasons, days, and years. Let these light in the sky shine above the earth, and so it was. God therefore made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the smaller light to govern the night. And then God made the stars as well, and he placed them in the ceiling of the sky to give light upon the earth and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, and there was morning, and there was evening, and it was the fourth day. So, I mean, right from the start, we see that there are some issues with the... Um, with the creation account, because God, first of all, creates light uh, twice. Now, before before I get too deep into this, I'm going to go ahead and just um, give you a thought as to, to what we're doing here. Um, these scriptural interpretations will likely be different from things that you have heard in the past, and that is okay. Um, there is no one interpretation of scripture. 
there are many, many, many interpretations of Scripture. And um, the way that we are open to interpretation of Scripture, I'm just going to give you a very quick rundown on kind of the process by um, one of my teachers um, and kind of a, and a major influence on me, a woman named Megan McKenna, um, who has taught us that with her work with, with some Judaic scholars, <coughs> there are, who call scripture this. Um, a lot of the rabbis and, and teachers um, in Judaism will say that scripture is like black fire on white fire, meaning that the printed word that you see is the black fire, and that there are ever so many different types of interpretations for that, almost 44 different levels of interpretation for each word, each punctuation mark, each space, which is all intimately connected to the way that it is written, as well as different interpretations for the white fire, the page upon which it's written. So, you know, you've heard the phrase reading between the lines. Well, here, in terms of scripture, if we are to believe that scripture is inspired by God, um, then we are to believe that God has a lot of different things to say to us, not just one. So a fundamentalist reading of scripture is something that I reject. Um, and this is one interpretation that was helpful for me at one point. Um, we know that, or, or we recognize that when reading scripture, when reading anything, really, it only appeals to us based on the point of life that we're in. So if I were to ask you to read, um, you know, James Joyce's Ulysses or um, Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, I have no doubt that intellectually you could capture these things, um, but I, I'm not sure it would mean much of anything to you. Like, I, I recall... I recall reading Shakespeare in high school and being miserable and not understanding. I recall reading The Odyssey as a freshman in high school and, oh, Lord, what a terrible, terrible time to do that to a child, you know, like I was a kid. And here I'm faced with, with reading one of the most beautiful poems ever written um, and really a mystical piece of literature. Uh, and it was just way above my head. Like, I, I had nothing, nothing to do with it. You know, so we can ruin stories for people if we, if, if we make them um, take a look at them too early. So here, in our account of, of the creation of the light and the creation of the light and day, um, we see that the first thing that was there, and the Spirit of God sits over the waters. The water is another term for the abyss, the deep, the unknown. Um, and when God creates the moon... There in verse 14, we see that the moon is the, um, the controller of the waters, of the unknown, of the depth. And therefore, the moon is the, cre the controller of the darkness, or the evil. I mean, let's just make it very explicit. Whereas the sun, the sun is creative. The sun, um, you know, the waters swallow things up. The wa waters, the rains come and, and they destroy things. Um, the waters come and, and they flood places. This is a destroyer. And we know now, I mean, after, this is, this is ancient. This is ancient times. This is, um, you know, even prior to, or, you know, prior to the, the Greeks and all this good stuff. But we know now that the moon controls, you know, the tides of the ocean. You know, so, so there's some, there's some interesting truth to some of these things. Um, and, and we see that the creation, the creative element of the world, the sun, um, is the thing that's, that's good, you know, it's warm, it, it, it helps to tend to our plants, um, it, it keeps us, you know, gives us vitamin D, for crying out loud, it keeps us, uh, alive. So, so all of these things are good, so what, what did God create in the first, when God is over the abyss? Well, God creates goodness to battle the darkness. So in chapter one, we see that the world, our universe, everything, what was it prior to God? Well, God must have been good. 
Because the only thing else was the waters, the abyss, the nothingness, the darkness. So, and you know, we see, again, as we talked a little bit about earlier, there's duality here. There is a sense of good and evil. Uh, let's jump ahead to Adam and Eve, who we see are nice little claymation friends here. Adam and Eve um, are made, and, and the initial story about Adam and Eve is that God creates all of these different creatures and, and then desires to create um, something in God's image. So God takes dirt, mud, Adam, the mud creature, and, and makes Adam. And Adam comes out, and Adam's not made in the image of the likeness in God, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you can differ in your belief and opinion, but um, God is not some big, you know, happy uh, grandfather in the sky um, who looks just like us. But God is made in the image and likeness of God because God has consciousness, and God knows. Whereas all these other animals um, are not made with consciousness. They do not know. All right. Um, so Adam is made and Adam spends the vast majority of, of his time giving names to animals. We see that in chapter 2 verse 20. So man gave names to all the cattle, the birds in the air, and the beasts of the field. And we can just imagine how long that take, took looking for um, some type of a helper. And then, after that, still Adam is sad, man is sad, so God makes him a helper from himself. He takes one of his ribs and, and makes him a companion. And really, and what something that should be a beautiful um, story is kind of bastardized and made into this um, different type of a thing, where women are now subservient to men uh, because, you know, they're woe men, they're from man. Um, and we see that all throughout the Dark Ages, the medieval period, but if we look at it, um, Adam so longs for um, the compliment to him, man so longs for the compliment to him, um, that he's willing to give of himself in order for his his foil to be made um, and and we don't necessarily need to to look much further than that in relationships we know that in order for a relationship to work there has to be give and take we need to empty ourselves you know when we talk about our heart breaking um, that's only because it's been filled with, with with love from another I don't I don't want to get too cheesy um, so I'm just gonna stop right there for now for now. So anyway, the um, the woman is of course tempted by evil, tempted by the serpent, but this is not sin. Let's take a look at this um, chapter 3. The serpent was the most crafty of all wild creatures that Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said, we may eat fruit of the trees in the garden. But the fruit that is in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat, you must not touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. But God knows the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God's, knowing good, knowing evil. So the woman saw that the fruit was good to eat, that it was pleasant to the eye, and most importantly, that it was ideal for gaining knowledge. She took the fruit, ate it, and gave some to her husband, who was with her. He ate it, and their eyes were open. So, at this point, we see, first and foremost, oh, let's, I mean, let's finish it up. So, now, chapter 3, verse 22. Then Yahweh, then Yahweh said, The man has now become like one of us, making himself judge of good and evil. Let him not stretch out his hand, and take and eat from the tree of life as well, so that they may live forever. So God cast them out of Eden to till the soil from which they had been made. And after having driven the man out, God posted cherubim and a flaming sword and kept turning at the east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So 
Never in Chapter 3 is the word sin mentioned. We often consider this to be original sin, but never is sin mentioned. In fact, um, human beings, Adam and Eve, or man and woman, eat so that they can become like God and know good from evil. The name of the tree that they eat from is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It couldn't be more explicit. So, without this act, we would say that we wouldn't know, we wouldn't have free will. The first time sin is mentioned is in chapter 4 here. When Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the fields. Once there, Cain turned to his brother and killed him. Um, Yahweh had said to Cain, why are you angry and downcast? If you do right, why do you not look up? But if you're not doing what is right, sin is lurking at your door and is striving to get you, and you must control it. This is the first time that the word sin is used, and it's in reference to Cain killing Abel. Uh, the original sin, as we know, is really gaining knowledge. All right? And God casts them out of the garden so that they do not become like him and suffer eternal life. Because at that point, Adam and Eve would know all, would have knowledge of and the ability to choose right from wrong, which is, you know, a blessing and a curse, as you know. And not only that, but they would live forever. They would be eternal. And therefore, they would be as God is. And God did not want them to suffer eternal life. Um, so we still see kind of a benevolent creature there. And we don't see sin until we see murder. And, you know, it's, it's worth it for us to ask how our world would change if murder was the original sin. It really is. And so we move into the first week. And what we see in the first week is meditations not only on sin, our own sin, personal sin, but on the sins of the world and how we, as human beings, respond to these things. And, I mean, the scriptural reference that I give to you here is entitled, you know, it's that famous kind of John 3.16 where you see the, uh, I don't know, you guys are probably, you may not remember, but that used to be really popular at, at sporting events to hold up John 3.16. And the reason why was because many Christians felt like this particular verse kind of encapsulated the entirety of the faith, if you will, in one phrase. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, so that none of you may perish, but instead rise to eternal life. And it's this idea that, that God, this creative element of the world, of course this God is going to forgive you. How could this God not forgive you? This thing that, that this creator that created the universe, that you know, created Saturn and Uranus and Venus and the stars and these billions upon billions of stars and solar systems and all of these different things, cares about you right now, right here. And how insane is that to kind of put grasp our minds around? Um, so as we take a look at sin, we see sin, you know, as a a breaking, um, and and it's it's perhaps helpful for us to understand sin when, once we take that path of darkness as moving away from our purpose in life. All right, so. You know, there's nothing in and of itself wrong with, you know, let's say, um, I don't know, watching 12 hours of television a day. Um, nothing bad is going to happen because of that. Um, but nothing good is going to happen because of that either. You know, and while you're, you're vegging out watching all of that television, what aren't you doing? Um, how are you not, or how are you? Um, using your life to, to praise and reverence what is good. Um, so when we separate ourselves from God, um, we make ourselves unhappy. 
is basically what it comes down to. So how you know screwy the world must be for God to send prophets into it. You know, because prophets really, I mean, prophets are there to, to wake us up. They're there to kind of show us something different and to, to bring us forward. And that's why we kill them. That's why we persecute them. Um, and that's why we yell at them. So if we look at, at prophets, even modern day prophets, let's, let's take a look at them. Um, we see people like, you know, Dorothy Day, Sister Helen Prejean, who you read over the summer. Um, we see people like uh, Dean Brackley, who I'm going to go ahead and, and spend a lot of time with, with you, you all uh, this year. Um, Greg Boyle, Homeboy Industries. Um, all, all of these, these different folks who are pointing us towards something different, something bigger than ourselves. And we go after them because they frighten us and they challenge our beliefs that, you know, we've grown up with, our safety. They challenge our safety. Um, so the idea that, you know, who the person who is Jesus Christ in Christianity um, and the person, you know, who is Muhammad in Islam, and the person who is Buddha in uh, Buddhism. Um, and, I mean, I know that, that Gandhi is not a god, certainly, but um, really I would say that Gandhi is the greatest prophet of Hinduism. So these, these are all the prophet of the specific religion. So for God to send God to earth, not just a, a prophet or a person who is sent to call us out, but for God to send God to the world in order to dwell among it and to live as a human being, to understand human beings, that's something that's pretty powerful to, to grapple with. It's a very, very difficult tenet of faith. And, you know, all of these things are. Creation is a, is a difficult tenet of faith. And, and we'll kind of get to that towards the end, if you're still listening by that point. In the second week, we find ourselves looking at the person of Christ. So the first week kind of looks at, well, how could this possibly have happened? You know, who, who is this guy? Um, who is this God that, first of all, creates everything, and who? why would this God be so concerned with us as to, uh, to send God to us? So, in the second week, we take a look at what the call to discipleship means. Um, and if we are confronted with the fact that there are prophets among us, which I think that that's something, you know, regardless of what you call these people, leaders, um, prophets, visionaries, uh, bodhisattvas, w w whatever you want to call them, I'm not overly concerned with, but, but I think we have to admit that there are people who are special. And if those people are out there, and I think Christ would be considered one of them, regardless of whether or not you believe that Christ was God, or Jesus was God, I shouldn't, you know, right? then what do you do with that? You have to do something. You have to respond to it in some way. So you can't, you can't read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail and then just be like, oh, that's nice, and go sit down. Um, you, you have to respond to it in one way or another. It's not like watching an episode of, you know, South Park um, or, you know, something of that nature. So what does Christ want? Well, we see the first instance of what Christ wants in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 in the Beatitudes uh, so I mean you can take a look at them as you desire uh, but the Beatitudes are really a call to to show us 
who is in and who is out, if you will. I mean, there's going to be in chapter uh, 18 of Matthew, there's woes to people. Um, but let's take a, take a look at those who are good first. So in the first and the eighth group, the poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the eighth, blessed are those who suffer persecution for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are the two people who are already in the kingdom of heaven right now. The other ones, the, the future tense is used. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So who are these people? Well, the poor in spirit is an annoying phrase um, because to be poor in spirit might mean that you just are depressed. But as we've learned, not only through Christ, but through the Catholic Church and through a wide variety of different places, that just to be depressed is bad. But to not have anything to eat is way worse. So the poor are those people who are so despised by society that they are forced to beg to survive. So if you are forced to live off of others, and not only off of others, I mean, I live off of others by collecting a paycheck, but I have plenty of excess. Whereas these are the people who might live off of my excess if I were a bit more generous with it. So that's the poor. The poor are those who are so despised by society that they must beg to survive. When we mourn, it means that we seek pity. So when you are seeking pity, it's nobody wants to um, seek pity from others. Um, we want to be strong and individuals. But here, when we are so forlorn, that's again, we'll take whatever we can get. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth. The meek are those who are in debt. They're sick. They're dying, they're destitute, they're those who are widowed or have lost loved ones. When we are meek, we become unsure of ourselves, we lose ourselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Here we see social outcast, people who are demonized, or people who go against the grain, either by profession or reputation. So in Christ's time, it was prostitutes, tax collectors, things like that. In our time, I wonder who it would be, who would be those who are demonized based on profession. You know? uh, blessed are the merciful. Mercy. Now, justice is a theme that we're going to spend a lot of time on over the course of the next couple of weeks, but justice is the absolute bare minimum of what a person needs. To bring justice, um, you give it to those who deserve it. What is just in society? What is right? Mercy is something that is much more difficult for us to comprehend um, because mercy is given to people who do not deserve it. So, again, we'll reference uh, Dead Man Walking. In Dead Man Walking, um, you know, Poncelet is is not he's guilty, you know? Um and and Prejean knows that. Um and yet she still offers him mercy, even though he's committed this horrific crime of raping and murdering um this girl. And, and her boyfriend, she still offers him peace. I and mean, that's, that's earth-shattering stuff. Blessed are the poor of heart, for they shall see God. Poor of heart are those who are in solidarity with one another and with those who need help. So here we are living in community. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemakers are l literally those who stand between two different worlds of conflict and seek to find common ground between it. So, um, you know, if you're living in Israel and you're dealing um, with uh, Israel and, and, and Pakistan, 
then uh, you, you, my friend, you are a peacemaker. Um, and finally, those who suffer. If, if you find yourself in one of these previous groups, you, you're suffering, baby. Um, but the Beatitudes, those who are blessed, you, you want to be in that group. So, who is this Jesus guy? Well, we find that in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 20, that Christ is very early on in his public ministry. He's in his hometown, um, and he gets up and he's teaching, um, because he was, as a rabbi, he, he would have taught, he would have been able to handle the scrolls. They handed him the scroll that he wanted, he unrolled it, and he found the place where it was written, My friends, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to set the prisoners free, to recover the sight of the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord. Um, I, I, my hope is that you spent some time talking about Jubilee um, in last year's class and in your junior year, um, because it's an important concept. But that's what the year of the Lord is the year of Jubilee, where all debts are forgiven and where we acknowledge that we do not own the earth, that the earth owns us. So we go back and we give back what is excessive and that which we do not need. Um, in the year 2000, Pope John Paul II tried to um, call for a, a plan of action called Jubilee 2000. And what he wanted to do was to forgive all debts of third world nations. And uh, he found out just how um, impossible, really, this was. So, unfortunately, um, he was able to, he worked on this for about 10 years, and he was able to forgive about less than, than a 20th of 1% of, of the world's debt. Um, but this was a value that Christ said. Christ said, listen, you don't own the earth. You can't own the earth. The earth is bigger than you. You can put houses on it. You can build buildings on it, but you don't own it. It's everybody's. All right. Proclaiming good news to the poor. Well, we've seen that with the Beatitudes. But what else is there? Well, let's set the prisoners free. Okay, well... He doesn't mean literally setting the prisoners free, does he? Well, what does our American justice system do? Do we um, restore people to society? Well, no. We know that if you go to prison, you are you are incredibly likely of a fifty to seventy-five percent chance of going back to prison. So it's not a mean and scary place, a nasty place that people want to stay away from. It actually creates more criminals, it creates lifetime criminals. And, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of the people that we have in prisons right now are nonviolent offenders, uh, meaning that they're in there on drug charges, that they're in there, um, you know, for, for things, mostly for drug charges, thanks to the Reagans war on drugs, which is really just a war on, you know, the lowest class. But don't let me, please, don't let me commentate too, too much. Um, so let's free the prisoners. Well, you know, those are debts. These people are still being held in debtor's prison to an extent. So if you are poor, um, and this is something that we, we will go in depth on, but if you're poor, and you feel as though you have no way out, and you're going to start to, okay, now you have two options. You're living in, you know, the east end of Bridgeport. You're living in um, what was uh, Father Panic in, you know, the 1980s, let's say, just to kind of take it a little bit away from our lives. But this is the same thing that's happening now, so it doesn't really matter. So you're living in, in what is Father Panic or what was Father Panic, and you have two choices. You can go to a school system where the school board has um, disbanded and abandoned you um, and that you know is going to put you in a high school that has a 60% dropout rate, 
and you're going to be taught by some of the worst teachers in the state. And if you have a chance, if you keep on, if you work as hard as you possibly can, um, you might be able to gain a scholarship to college, possibly. And that's if, you know, that's it by being a subject of ridicule and scorn of your classmates for your entire school career. All right? Um, or you can do all that. You can go to college, and then when you graduate from college, you can learn what most college graduates are learning right now, that in a recession, there's no jobs for college graduates. Uh, so you spend all of that time doing all of these things, and to what end? Or you can go ahead and sell drugs, and you can immediately make, um, you know, a decent amount of money, really, a decent amount of money. Um, we see this in, in you know, Stephen Levitt's uh, book, Freakonomics, uh, about the pyramid schemes that drug dealers run. So, okay, you're going to take this person and you're going to throw him in jail with a whole bunch of other people who, you know, are like him. And what are you going to have him do? Are you going to give this person opportunities to better themselves? No, you're going to have him sit in jail for a certain amount of years, not doing anything. So, I mean, this is a, a system that just kind of repeats itself over and over and over again. It's hard to, to get out, and therefore it's, it's like the debtor's prisons that we used to see. If we set the oppressed free, then what we're doing is taking those and helping those who are fighting for justice. So whatever the cause may be, that's where we are, and we're standing in solidarity with those who are fighting for what we know to be right. And we'll get into those, those types of topics throughout the course of the year. Finally, to recover the sight of the blind. Well, what does that mean, to recover the sight of the blind? Well, I would propose, myself included in this, that many of us are blind to the realities of the world. Um... Many of us are blind even to the realities of our communities. So, you know, those of you who have attended an urban plunge know what it is like. Um, only five to seven minutes away in Bridgeport. And the types of struggles that families and children go through so close to us. So if we don't open ourselves up to those realities, and then if we don't do something with what we've learned about those realities, then we remain blind to the truth of the world. So in the end, Jesus is only concerned with three things, but they're three pretty big things. First, what does it mean to truly worship God? Second, care for the poor. And third, preparing the way for the coming kingdom of peace and justice not just preparing but establishing okay heaven is a concept of peace on earth justice on earth where we all recognize that we belong as one when we destroy the tower of babel um because it does not please god that we're apart so we'll keep on coming back to those themes the third week finds us into um, what Ignatius tells us is the, the ultimate expression of God's love. So this ultimate expression is that God not only comes, God not only sends God, but God dies. <laughs> God is so, God is, and I mean there's a couple different ways you can look at this. You can look at this as though God is rejected by the world which is, you know, something that, that Nietzsche would say, um, or that, that God sacrifices God's self for humans, which is just kind of a staggering idea. Um, so if we look at kind of the dark period of the Gospels, and, and we'll look at, at Matthew here, uh, we see that in chapter 21, 
God enters into Jerusalem. And man, is it going to hit the fan once Jesus enters into Jerusalem. It's all going down, baby. And it's happening quickly. Um, so, even at this point, Christ starts turning over some tables. He starts getting a little bit anxious, angry. This is the only violent act that we really see Jesus commit is turning over the tables. The actual only physically violent act. But shortly thereafter, in chapter 22, he, um, he curses a fig tree. Um, which is something that has a lot of, of, of symbolism for us, um, especially in the Gospel of Mark. When, when Christ enters into uh, the city of the Jerusalem, they have what we call a Mark and Sandwich, which I'm sure you learned about your junior year. Um, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem for the first time, he curses a fig tree so that it won't grow anymore. Um, foreshadowing the event that, that will, will come, you know, his... The, the rejection of God. Um, so so it's kind of an interesting symbol of of this thing that's meant to to bear fruit, this thing that's meant to 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 go forward, to expand. Um, and Christ is making it so that this thing will will never bear fruit again. It's killing it. Um, you know, killing, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting allegory for the killing of creation. Um, and of course, Christ as the God, <coughs> the God-man, is, is that person of creation. So, at the end here, there's some more good parables, and, you know, we'll spend some time on parables throughout the course of the year, but let's jump right on into the garden. Um, when Christ in the garden... First and foremost, he is spending a lot of time in prayer. Um, and we see that his disciples are constantly failing him. They fall asleep. They're falling asleep and watching. Christ is really, Jesus is really struggling with the reality of what must be done. Um, so, so, you know, when he's arrested in the garden, um, he, he goes... But he, he doesn't really want to. Father, verse 42, Father, this cup cannot be taken away from me without my drinking. Let your will be done. But please, you know, don't make me do this, man. <laughs> you know, and, and there's this, these beautiful, beautiful moments as Christ is, is, is dying. You know, and there's these great moments, obviously, where where different people are are believing in him. The the centurion soldier, um, you know, falls on his knees and says, "Truly, this was the Lord." Um, the prisoner next to him is set free, is 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 brought, you know, up into the the kingdom of heaven because he, of his belief. But still, it's the humanity, that the darkness, that really shines through for me. And then in Matthew 27, those verses 45 through 50, here's Christ is on the cross. And from midday, darkness fell over the whole land until mid-afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as soon as they heard this, some of the bystanders laughed, said, He is calling for Elijah. And one of them went quickly, took a sponge, and soaked it in vinegar, and putting it on a reed, gave him to drink. Others said, Now, let us see whether Elijah comes to his rescue. But Jesus just cried out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. So it's very simple death. You know, it's very human death. Um, and, you know, in our lives, there are so many different types of death. That we experience, we experience physical death when you know. For many of us at this point in our lives, uh, the only, hopefully, the only death that we've experienced is that of animals and that have been close to us, as well as maybe distant family members. Um, but but death is a reality of life, and not not just physical death, but the death of the spirit. Um, 
or the breaking of the spirit. I don't know if the spirit can ever truly be die, dead. But the the death of dreams, you know, when we realize that, that we're not going to be um, basketball players when we grow up in the NBA because uh, we're 5'6 and, and 180 pounds. Um, you know, the death of, of relationships as we grow older and grow apart from old friends. Um, you know, death is everywhere um, in our lives. And that's in the third week, that's just something that that we have to deal with, you know? And we will. We will deal with this, um, particularly as we look into Freud. Freud spends a lot of time with death. But the death doesn't last too long. Um, one of the, the hallmarks of God and creation is that things are cyclical. Everything comes around, you know? So right after this... This horrid scene in chapter 27 in Matthew that ends when Jesus cries out. And right the next verse, verse 51, suddenly the curtain of the temple of sanctuary was torn into the veil of the temple that separated the rabbi from the ark. It was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth quaked. Rocks were split. Tombs were open, and several holy people who were dead were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after the resurrection of Jesus, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. The captain, the soldiers, the guard of Jesus were greatly terrified when they saw the earthquake and all that had happened, and they said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also some women who watched from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and saw to his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the Zebedee's sons. And then Jesus appears to the women in chapter 28. After the Sabbath, at the appearance of the first star on the first day of the first week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, and the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, went to the tomb, rolled away the stone, and sat on it. His face was like lightning, and his garment as white as snow. And the guards trembled in fear and became like dead women when they saw the angels. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. He is not here. He is risen and said, Come, see the place where they laid him. Now go at once and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see them there. This is my message to you. Then Jesus met them on the way and said, Peace. The woman approached him, embraced his feet, and worshipped him. Jesus made, told them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So, what what's going on? There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, at this last chapter, I mean... The resurrection is, to, to me, and at the point where my life is at right now, the resurrection to me is not so much the idea that, that Christ conquers death, but there, there is life in death. There is renewal and ends. So, just like we pass from one stage of life into the next, um, you know, Christ's death teaches us how to live on if you will, and does so with the most um, the strangest of believers, if you will, from the soldiers who believe, fall down on their knees and worship. The veil is torn open. God, if you remember from your freshman year, um, the veil in the temple is holding or hiding um, the Ark of the Covenant. And the head rabbi in the temple would go and peek behind the veil once a year and whisper the true name of God into the ark um, in the holiest of holy ceremonies um, in, in all of Judaism. And so now that the veil is torn open so that all may see the ark, that all may see God, because remember the ark is where God is housed, God's word is housed, and therefore God, now that, that all human beings are privy and are, are welcomed in to salvation. This is monumental. And who does God 
now the god is available to all, the soldiers first are ones who are so hardened, the professional killers kneel down and worship this person. He appears first to women, um, you know, and, and this is no small feat that this appears in the oral tradition. Uh, it, it would have been fought by many people, and this Mary Magdala person, Mary of Magdala person who keeps on showing up is got to be somebody important because she's tasked with a very, very important job of going on ahead and telling the other disciples, hey, jackasses, get out of hiding and go on ahead to Galilee. Your boy is back, just like he said he was going to be. So there's a much being said here as there isn't being said. First of all, the fact that only the women are around him, only the guards are around him, all of his other disciples have abandoned him, and they're back in the house of the Last Supper fighting with themselves over what to do next. And only the women are there to, to share the message. Um, uh, this is this is just a, a big thing. And then, then the empowering of the Spirit, the final kind of act here, as Jesus sends the apostles forward. Jesus approached them and said, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go, make disciples from all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to fulfill all that I have commanded of you. I am with you always, until the end of time. My name, his name shall be Emmanuel, which means I am with you always. God with you. So, the big question is where do we go from here? And that is a big question. Uh, what do we take from all of this? This is a a brief introduction for rather enormous themes, you know, huge, huge, massive themes that, that will override the entirety of our course. They have themes that, that will determine, um, you know, what, where you do your service work, what you are interested in in this course, um, who says what and why and how. Um, our, our starting point, it's not surprising that our starting point is from a Christian perspective and from a, a Jesuitical or, or a society perspective, an Ignatian perspective, but that is not the only type of perspective that we'll take a look at this year. Um, and as a matter of fact, the next person that, that we're really going to take a look at next week as we I kind of set up the, as we set up the next stuff um, is the person of Plato. Um, and just very briefly as a, a, a preview, preview alert, preview alert, um, we know that Plato was born um, anywhere between 350 to 400 BC, or 400 to 350 BC, um, and that in, in Greece, um, Plato is the father uh, of Western philosophy. Um, and really, Plato's influence upon our understanding of Christianity is, is not to be uh, neglected. And that's why it's important to study Plato for Plato's self. Uh, so we'll take a look at that next week. But for this week, let's go ahead and take a look at um, who we are, what our generation is, and how all of these different types of things can kind of work in uh, collusion with one another. So thanks for